Let's pray, shall we, as we come to God's word. Almighty God, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you that you are a God who speaks to us, who shows us truth. So, Father, we pray as we come to this word, perhaps a word that we find difficult or confusing, we pray, Lord, that by your spirit, you would bring clarity. We pray that by your spirit, you would turn our hearts to Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Saviour, and that he would be lifted high in the words that I say and in the meditations of our hearts. In his name we pray, for his glory. Amen. Amen. Well, please do keep your Bibles open at Revelation 13. And uh, it's quite a chapter, isn't it? Um, and I, I think of all the, the lurid and, and vivid imagery that we've seen so far in Revelation, the pictures given in these verses seem perhaps to have captured the attention of humanity more than any other. Over the centuries, people have provided countless interpretations of this passage. Countless human figures have been identified with the beast and his mark, his number, have been the subject of seemingly endless speculation. In the first century, he was the Emperor Nero. Later, during the Reformation, the beast was variously revealed to be the Pope or Martin Luther, depending on which side you were on. And a more recent suggestion, apparently, attributes all the, the chaos and destruction in these verses to a supercomputer in Belgium. But as we come to these verses today, we need to remember that this is revelation. The point of this vision is a revealing. That's what apocalypse means. John is not writing in order to deliver a secret code, to pass on an encrypted message. Now he is writing in order to reveal to reveal the mystery of God, to make known the plans of our creator and king in this, the final age, before his son, our Lord, returns to bring this chapter of human history to a close. And so we can come to this passage not with, with trepidation or uncertainty, not weirded out by what it says, but rather we can come expectantly, ready to, to hear what God will reveal to us, ready to understand something of his perspective on the events of human history. Will we understand it all? Probably not. But will we understand enough to know that God is in control, that we can trust him, and that the trials and, and tribulations of this life will one day give way to the glory of the new creation. Absolutely. For that is why the Lord gave this vision to his servant John and asked him to write it down for his people. Now I should say that the whole supercomputer thing, that's not real. It doesn't exist. But evil is real. And this passage gives us a, a real insight into what's going on behind the scenes as we experience that evil in this, our world. So let's read again from verse 1. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound but the fatal wound had been healed. 
whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? Now we know from verse 9 of chapter 12 that the dragon is Satan. And this beast then is the means by which the dragon achieves what he set out to do at the end of that previous chapter to wage war against those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. The beast is the means by which Satan will persecute the church of Christ. Only, this is not the first time we've seen a beast like this in Scripture. In fact, this beast here in Revelation 13 seems to be an amalgamation of four beasts that we encounter in the book of Daniel. There in in chapter 7, Daniel has a dream featuring a beast like a lion, one like a bear, another like a leopard, and a fourth more terrifying than the other three, which had ten horns and was, was frighteningly powerful. It's not hard to see, is it, that, that this beast in Revelation, it, well, it's all of Daniel's beasts rolled into one awful, terrible, evil power. Called out of the chaos of the sea and, and given authority to rule on the earth and wreak havoc in the name of the devil. It's a scary picture, isn't it? A horrible monster bent on destruction determined to gather the whole world under its power and dominion. But in Daniel, the four beasts he sees, well, well, they're identified as human kingdoms, as empires that, that we can know from history. And so as we come to this one composite beast in Revelation 13, I don't think we're supposed to see a a single climactic event of persecution. This is not one single power that is worse than all the others, one single despotic tyrant who will out-evil all the others that have come before him. No, rather, it is a, a composite picture of a long history of human leaders and regimes bringing suffering, and death upon those whom they rule. A long and and continuing history of human leaders claiming what is only God's to claim. One of the ways in which Satan has carried out his pursuit and persecution of the church throughout the centuries is through the human powers of the day. The ruler of this age, as he's known, rules through proxies. That's what we see in verses 5 to 8. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. You see, the beast wages war against God's people, God's holy people. And he conquers them. Now, for those who first heard John's words, there would have been a very obvious application of this in the Roman Empire. Indeed, in their very recent history, they would know one who who very closely matched the description found here. The Emperor Nero was particularly violent and, and zealous in his persecution of Christians. He was even known by the nickname The Beast, And the fledgling church of Christ suffered terribly under his rule. 
And some may even have have seen something of Nero in the seemingly fatal wound of verse 3. A fatal wound that had been healed. You see, there was a, a rumor at the end of the first century that Nero had not, in fact, died. But rather, he was, he was waiting, waiting to return with renewed anger and violence. He would reappear from beyond the grave to continue his reign of terror. Some have suggested that perhaps John is, is simply repeating that myth in these verses. But you know what? I don't think we need to say that. Because the reality is that when Nero died in 68 AD, when he was removed from the picture, the persecution didn't end. There may have been some temporary respite, but in essence, the Roman Empire remained opposed to Yahweh and hostile to his people. You see, Nero did come back, not as some sort of zombie ruler, but in the next generation of godless rulers. The next manifestation of Satan's power being wielded here on earth. It was Nero's successor, Titus, who destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and set up his own image in the middle of it. And his brother, Domitian, the next emperor, He was the emperor at the time that the revelation was written. And it was he who cemented the imperial cult, demanding that that every citizen of the empire worship him as Lord and God. And so what we see is that in every age, the powers of this world set themselves up in opposition to God and to his people. In every generation, there are human powers which express here on earth the great cosmic battle that rages in the spiritual realm. It's not that every human institution is equally evil, or that every human leader is in league with the devil. God, in his kindness, has given us human governments precisely to restrain evil and to bring good order to our lives. But in every generation, there are those in power who seek to usurp God, to unseat him from his throne, and to claim the worship of his creatures for themselves. So is the beast Nero? Undoubtedly. And he's also Titus, and Domitian, and Attila the Hun, and Genghis Khan, and Stalin, and Hitler, and Saddam Hussein, and Kim Jong-un. Over and over again, this beast has been slain, only to rise again. Evil empires have fallen, only to be replaced by something worse. The people of God have known periods of rest, but it's never been long before the next manifestation comes along. Empowered by the dragon himself, wielding terrible and frightening power. That is the pattern of this, the church age. That is how the dragon pursues and and persecutes those who hold fast their testimony about Jesus Christ. And so what are we to do? Faced with seemingly endless persecution, how are the followers of Jesus to respond? Well, the answer comes in the next few verses, and it's an answer that will profoundly challenge us in our present-day culture of pride and self-sufficiency. Let's read on, verse 9. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Patient endurance 
and faithfulness. That's what we're called to. Suffering and and struggle and pain and death will come. That's what we're to expect. And our response is to be one of patient endurance. Not revolution to overthrow the evil powers. Not activism to, to demand our rights and claim our freedoms. There may be times when it is right for us to publicly oppose the regimes we live under. We're certainly to to speak up for truth and justice, to defend the weak and the vulnerable, to seek peace and stability. But this is not a call to arms. It's not a revolutionary manifesto. Rather, it's a description of what it means to live faithfully in a land, in a world, that is not our home. You see, it's no accident that it is Daniel and Jeremiah who have featured prominently in this passage. No accident that it was Ezekiel and Zechariah in the previous chapters. You see, these are are the prophets of exile. Those who speak the words of God to a people far from home to a people living under a foreign power, surrounded by false gods, under pressure to bow the knee to them, dislocated and displaced, disturbed and distressed. And the call then to the exiles in Babylon was not to revolution, but rather to quiet faithfulness, to solid and and patient commitment to Yahweh, however powerful the the surrounding rulers appeared to be. And the message of, of Revelation is that that experience of exile continues into the church age. The people of God are profoundly a dislocated and displaced people a people who find themselves in a foreign land, far from home, under the rule of a power that does not and will not willingly submit to the one who truly sits on the throne. That was the reality for the people of God in Daniel's day. It was the reality in John's day under successive Roman emperors And it is the reality for God's people today. Because you see, we may not be living under a dictatorial tyrant as they were, and as many believers are today in other parts of the world. But overt and violent oppression is only one of the tools that the devil employs in his desire to wage war against God's people. He also has more subtle, more deceptive angles of attack. Let's read on from verse 11. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. A second beast comes into view, Uh, but in contrast to the first, we're told very little of its appearance, apart from one crucial detail, which will set the tone for the way in which this beast will seek to lead the people of earth astray. This beast is like a lamb. In fact, in the verses that follow, it becomes clear that it's not only its two horns that that make it like a lamb. Everything about this beast is a parody, an imitation of the lamb. In verse 13, the, the beast calls down fire from heaven, just as God did in response to the prophets of Baal. In verse 15, we see replayed the drama of, of Revelation 11. There, it was the the faithful witnesses who were revived by the breath of God. Here, the first beast 
is revived by the breath of the second. And where God marked his people with a seal in chapter 7, now this beast claims all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, as his own, branding them with his own mark. And to what end all this imitation? Well, verse 14. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. In a a sick caricature of the glorious vision we saw around the throne of heaven, this second beast calls people to worship. To worship not the risen lamb who was slain, but to worship the revived beast who was wounded. Here in this second beast, we see a representation of all false religion, all idolatrous leadership, of all those through the ages who have called on people to give themselves to anything other than the true and living God those who have compelled humanity into the worship of worthless idols. Today in this country, we may be less familiar with the open warfare of a a violent tyrant. But we certainly know the deception and enticement of a regime that seeks to turn our heads from the one who sits on the throne of heaven. How adept are our leaders, political and cultural, are at imitating the Lamb. They promise us freedom, independence, self-determination, but they deliver only bondage to the prevailing ideology, to the tyranny of consumerism, of ever needing, wanting more. They claim constant progress. But in reality, they simply ask us to to transfer our worship to something else. Sex, money, career, image. This beast offers so much. But it is all false propaganda. Peddled in the name of the dragon, that great deceiver. So no wonder in verse 18 that we're told this calls for wisdom. And the number of this beast, his mark, well, I don't think we need to ascribe that to barcodes or microchips. It is possible to make some connection between the name Nero and the number 666. But only if you translate it from Greek to Hebrew and then spell it slightly wrong. Far more likely, this is just a a further distortion of the true glories of God and his Christ. Where seven is used throughout John's vision to represent goodness and perfection, so six falls short. A symbol that the, the person with insight will see for what it is, a cheap imitation of the real and true power in this universe. Where our God is holy, holy, holy. Here, Satan and his minions are seen to be evil, evil, evil. What Revelation 13 shows us is just how that evil is expressed through the rulers and powers of every generation. Through direct and and violent oppression and through subtle and deceptive idolatry. This is what it will look like for the dragon to wage war against the people of God. It is what it has always looked like. Our Lord Jesus knew both the the deceptive wiles of Satan in his temptations and his direct 
violent oppression. And our Lord Jesus, as he hung on the cross, was conquered. Surely Satan had won. And the followers of the Lamb follow the Lamb. We may expect to meet with opposition, violent and powerful, subtle and crafty. And we know that these beasts who, who rule in the name of the dragon will conquer. They will triumph. But not really. Not in the final analysis. Because those who follow the lamb follow the lamb. And just as he rose to life on the third day, disarming the powers and authorities, triumphing over them by the very cross that seemed to seal his defeat. So too, one day, those who hold fast their testimony about Jesus, those who endure patiently and faithfully, they will follow the Lamb to victory and to glory. Every single human empire, once proud and powerful, will one day be but dust. Every tyrant, every despot, every deceiver and trickster, even the beasts and the dragon themselves, their power will not last forever. Because there is another kingdom coming. A kingdom that will never end. A kingdom whose king rules with justice and righteousness, with glory and honor. That's what we'll see play out in, in the coming chapters of Revelation. And that's what we'll see play out one day on the stage of human history. And in the meantime... This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Let's pray. Almighty God, we ask for your help. We ask for the power of your spirit that we might patiently endure and be faithful. Lord, we confess as we hear these images, as we see them being enacted around our world in the strong and powerful leaders of our day, in the deceptive and cunning ideologies. Lord, we confess that, that we are scared, that we feel powerless. But Lord, we pray in those times that we would see that you still reign, that Jesus Christ still sits on the throne, and that where he has led, so we too will follow through suffering and death, to victory and glory. And so, Father, sustain our brothers and sisters around the globe who know the direct and unviolent oppression of Satan through his proxies. Lord, sustain us in a culture that has set itself up against the true power of this universe and that would seek to to lead us astray as well. Lord, by your spirit, give us patient endurance and faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.